Hi. Um, good morning, I guess. Morning. Um, welcome to our presentation on updating education and the integration of Google into the modern course. So this presentation is by Matias, myself, Pedro, and Yoshi. So we wanted to talk a little bit about ourselves. So I personally are part of a club in National Peru called TSA, which is Technology Student Association. Um, amongst all the projects we do, uh, we donate computers to schools in need. We host game nights every every six months to raise profit, to raise money so that we can do projects like this. And we generally provide tech support in the school in order to uh, raise awareness of our club, to recruit new members, as well as just to provide a service to our community. Hi, my name is Yosuke Segrida, and I work for a club called Kriamas, which is a um, community service club, which we'll talk in a second, but um, for now. And I'm Pedro. Uh, I'd like to tell my story here. The, I'm a student in the Innovation Academy, which is a new program that is geared towards project-based learning, experiential learning, and learning through experience. So, sorry, I should yeah. And, um, the thing that's behind the Innovation Academy is that education is being done wrong, that there are values that we value that no one else uses. Um, and a lot of what we do is based on real-time or real-life experience. So we each have, we have like a technology aspect, an uh, innovation aspect, and a service aspect in our group. And so what our group was really trying to focus on was looking at problems that we could solve in our community, giving our technical aspects and what we could bring to the table in terms of our project. And what did we notice? That the digital divide was a big problem in the group, especially in developing schools, where they had the computers that we had donated, the internet which they bought themselves as a, as a service that the uh, school provided to the students, and which the students didn't really know how to use. And the teachers didn't either, so we decided to uh, just kind of step in and become the teachers. Because we think that the education system is broken as it is right now. We live in the 21st century, and we have 21st century problems which can only be solved through the use of technology. So, what was our solution? Teach the right things. Teach the right things that will be um, relevant in the, in the world we live in, and especially useful for children that are in need which don't have the same uh, privileges that we have, the same uh, opportunities, and that is what we're trying to provide them to them. So, uh, these are the things that would be taught in a normal school. History, trigonometry, chemistry, physics. All these things might not be very useful to a normal, student, to a normal person in their daily lives. I mean, when was the last time you had to use this? Unless you're an engineer or, a special, or in a specialized field, you might not need this. So what we really want to do is teach relevant things to the children, especially since their education is so um, low-key, so uh, primitive in a, in a sort of sorts. Uh, we want to teach the right things so that the things that they do learn stay in them and help them. And we plan this, well, teaching the, the useful things. And that's why the lessons that we teach, um, we try to uh, make them so that they will be relevant throughout the student's life. And we use this through Google. Google Suite of Apps, uh, Google Docs, Google Mail, Google Search, and Google Calendar are what we're trying to focus on during our lessons, through our lessons, in order to teach the children. Um, they're also for free, which are cer is certainly uh, an aspect that we took into consideration when choosing Google. It's freely available to whoever has an internet connection and a computer, obviously. And it can be synced throughout multiple computers. Collaboration is possible. So a host of uh, good things are available through a Google program. As I said, Drive, Gmail, Calendar, Search are the most important aspects of the things we're teaching. And this is what we really focused on. Uh, making students attractive to businesses by Helping them learn about these aspects would make them, uh, we would highlight them in the view of the businesses they're trying to apply to. So we would make them more successful when they try to apply, and we would raise their standard of living through this. We facilitate their learning by making the learning process they endure every day much easier. I mean, 
I can certainly say that I've been helped with technology in my early learning by using a laptop, using my phone. A phone. Um, it's much easier than writing stuff down. It's much more effective. And finally, if you're interested in technology, in a world that is so technologically embedded, we really need to make students have a passion for technology because it's such a big part in our world today that if you have a passion for technology and you strive to become a better person and learn more about technology, you're pretty much going to be very successful or much more successful than if you, than if you didn't do this. So, we want to give them the ability to plan using uh, uh, the calendar aspect of Google Docs. We want, we want them to give them the ability to plan their, their deadlines, to organize themselves. We want them to give them the ability to connect using the feedback systems and the interaction systems that are intrinsic part, part of the Google Docs, uh, especially, and give them the ability to create. Create um, works that they would have not been able to, to do on their own without technology. Present, give them the ability to show their ideas to people and to solve their own problems. Run them to give them the, the motivation to not only learn what people tell, what people teach them, but also learn on their own. Because this is what's really most important in our society today. Being able to look at a problem that you have and finding ways to solve it on your own. Independence is a highly valued uh, aspect of anyone, really, which is what businesses want in their employees. The independence to be able to solve your own, problem, your own problems and all these tools which are important in businesses today so that they can be efficient workers and generally good persons, good people. So just let me lay, lay this out for you. We live in, I think it's 2014, right? Yeah. So we live in a world that is um, no longer this hyper-industrial era that we grew up in. I think you, you might have heard me say this, but we live in the information age. And the information age is all about acquiring information and knowing what you can do with that information, right? So let's just think about Peru, because we are from Peru, and we think about the majority of our education system is based mostly among just sitting down, listening to the teacher ramble on, fall asleep, write notes that we will never use, and no one comes out winning, and a lot of the poverty cycle just keeps repeating itself. All right, so what can us three tech guys, geeks, nerds, whatever you want to call us, do to move education forward, push it into a, into a place where these kids can find it useful. Let's see. So our solution is pretty much, uh, there we go. This is our solution plan. We wanted to make contact with a community and with a low technology exposure, and we did this by connecting through TSA. Um, TSA does the hardware aspect of the, of the project because they go out and give computers that we don't use in our school, and we have like 50 of them. Last year alone, we, we went and we took like 20, I think it was, more or less, 24, and they don't really follow that up. So, okay, great, you have a computer, and probably none of the students in the school, and maybe like one or two of the teachers are gonna know how to use it. So what good does it do them to have a computer, right? All right, so let's go in and give them classes. How should we give them classes? Give classes on technology through four different aspects of Google. Search, Drive, Calendar, and Mail. Right? I'm going to talk about what each of those brings to the kids in just a second. Um, obviously, you want routine checks on the progress of the kids, because if it's not working, if they're having trouble, we might need to reorient or even cut the program if it's not really useful to them. Right? Um, so it's a lot about constant feedback, this constant feedback cycle that lets us know if the education is truly getting better or if we're just wasting our time. Um, we want to adapt the teaching methods as required. Actually, this is something that Ms. Rumble, our supervisor, brought up. What if you have a class of five-year-olds? How different will it be than if you have a class of 12-year-olds or 16-year-olds? How are you going to teach them that drive is to type um, to a class of five-year-olds that probably want to go and play games? Um, and how is it going to be different, right? So you need to be able to adapt. Well, we need to be able to adapt. Um, and we wanted the community to become self-driven. I wanted to find maybe two or three people per grade that were really motivated toward this. And, and these kids would get like the majority of our time and making sure that they could teach their peers. Because this is all about autonomy. This is all about self-sustainability. All right? So 
The plan was to give the kids exposure to 21st century material that they could find relevant if they ever got out of this poverty cycle that they live in. Because a lot of these kids here in these areas, like we're talking San Juan de Lurigancho, um, what else, Callao, places that are dirt poor and the kids end up just working like, it's not even worthy to talk about. If you guys want to read about poverty in Peru, and there's a lot of material on it and it's just a bad situation to be in. So if you want these, if we, if we want these people to get out of this cycle, um, we need to be able to have them be able to work in the time that we live in. Um, we wanted them to have, uh, I put here the ability to achieve a higher form of learning. Well, a lot of these kids come out with no knowledge at all just because of the teaching methods used, right? And you know what, the second bullet point in here is actually the most important one, the belief in themselves to be able to do something. Because if you believe in yourself and you believe that you can have an impact on someone, not only yourself, but on a community, you'll be able to pull yourself out of poverty, right? So we want to empower the kids and anyone really that's interested in technology to be able to pull themselves out and not require help from anyone else. Short classes, simple topics, friendly software. This is kind of our motto here. Um, these, this pretty much encompasses what we see in the future of these kids, uh, especially in our program. Short classes, we need to keep their attention and we need to load them with content and then let them play. Because tinkering around is how I learned to build computers and how he learned to program. And that's how you learn with technology. Not just someone teaching it to you, instructing it to you, but say, okay, what can you do with what you know already? How can you create? And that's what we want to give the kids. So, there's four aspects to this. Google search being the first one. Google search provides self-assurance in knowing that you can find the information you need um, in seconds. And a lot of these kids aren't going to have you know, what we have right now, these nice little devices that we call iPhones. And they're going to have access to them in their computer, computer labs. But they still have more information than rather going into an encyclopedia and looking through the pages, and now I'm bored, and what was I thinking about? Right, so these kids are not used to having access to information that's not told to them. And that, for me, biggest seller on Google search. Um, yeah, sorry, the key here is knowing how to find it, how to document it, and then use it. For God's sake, if you have information, I bet you you guys all know some kind of useless fact that it's just that, it's useless. And if you can't apply it, there's no point in doing it. It's wasting up brain space, wasting up storage space. So Google Drive. Google Drive provides the ability to share documents, whatever, whatever they want to do, whatever they have to do. Documents, presentations, spreadsheets, forms, all of this is all like constant feedback and constant creation. Simple. Google Mail allows these kids to actually have some form of presence in the 21st century business world. If they have an email, they can actually you know, sign up to newsletters that they want to learn about. So say this kid is really passionate about gardening and he has some space in his house um, for some gardens. All right, let's sign up to some newsletters. Let's get started on searching up what do I need to do and then maybe we can uh, help fundraise him, right? So um, it pretty much access, uh, it gives them access to countless uh, sites, it gives them email, like I know Britannica Online requires email and so many other things that require emails, kind of necessary. The ability to send and receive messages, receive mostly, because send, you got to remember that these kids have only uh, access in their computer labs, and a way for others to reach the students, business, their peers, their teachers, and hopefully us, and any others that come up. Calendar. It pretty much provides the ability to organize themselves and the knowledge that they need to be able to share with their classmates that they are going to do this project by the state. And their education is already taking a step forward in the sense that they're actually sharing their deadlines and not only keeping them to themselves. It's more of a modularity thing because no, not only are your professors giving them deadlines anymore, um, but they, they themselves are giving them deadlines and sharing them across their peers. Um, visibility. The visibility to others to know that they did this over this amount of time and they were able to come out with this at this amount of time, all through calendar. And again, an incentive to organize themselves and, and know that they can flow into a project better. And the idea is to maximize the impact and minimize the time taken. Because if we are wasting, not wasting, sorry, using six months of our time for these kids to learn how to type, we need to seriously reevaluate what kind of target we're going for. 
And again, this comes back to the constant feedback loop. If you if we're using too much time on something and it's really not helpful, cut it. If we need to teach to spend six months on just teaching the kids how to press a button, that's the first step. It's worth it. So we go on. Feedback. So now, these are the benefits and these are the limitations, and I'm just going to read them off here. Um, it's easy to teach, it's easy to learn on our parts, and hopefully it will on theirs. And it's accessible and free, and it is secure. Um, accessible and free for them means that any students, whenever they come into the school and whenever they uh, start getting enveloped in our program, means that they'll be able to just start in, um, and they'll have instant access, as to everyone else in the school does. Security is a factor, and they can choose who they share their work with and who they don't. And even though it may not seem like a big a deal, I'm sure that there's always people looking out there to exploit kids, and they're probably no different. The limitations, it's hard to adapt to that new learning style. I'm not really worried about the kids. I'm worried about the teachers that are going to say, no, they need to write the plus sign perfectly in the grid square. Or no, they have to write the phrase 10 times because that's how I learned, and that's how they'll learn. And that, for me, is the biggest Barrier, we have to jump over. So we have to imprint those new learning methods on the students as well. And that's hard because they're used to something that is completely new. Um, the reliance on the students for learning is actually also something I should have touched more on. But we have to rely on them that they have the motivation to take it further than just our classes. Because if we're only going once a week or twice a week or whatever our, our program allows us to do, it's not going to get them punched forward. And they have access to it at their school. So if they can just have some time to work and be able to, to say, OK, let's tinker around with this. Let's, let's play. That is kind of something we need to drive into the students. And it's key for the success of the project. And yeah, that's what I just said. We can't always be there. This is a quote I want to end my section with. And it says, teaching is in the internet age means we must, we must teach tomorrow's skills today. We don't know what we're going to need tomorrow, but we sure as hell know that we need to have a technology base today, right? The fundamentals of tech are necessary to thrive in our modern industrial, uh, sorry, information age. So this is a quote that I found extremely powerful, and I'd like to focus our vision around it. So the only thing we're missing is the uh, determination to teach and to learn, both on our side and the student side. Now, to implement this um, solution, we've been working with three organi organizations within our school, which are Kuremas, TSA, and Techo. We'll talk about Kuremas in a second, and for TSA, Pedro and Matias has explained a bit. And Techo, um, as some of you may know, Techo Club is a club, community service club, which they go to club, um, build houses to communities um, in poverty. And since they build houses, we thought we might be able to work with those children while, they build, um, while the teacher members build houses. We can actually plan a mini lessons and um, teach basics of technology to those children. Now, more about Kuremas. Um, I'm president of Kuremas, and I have contacts um, with Kuremas of Peru, which um, administration and And um, we will work with these schools every Saturday. Um, we teach, uh, they have two sessions in the morning, which the first one is mathematics. And the second one are workshops. There are workshops such as cooking, um, craftsmanship, sports, dancing, music, a lot of things kids can enjoy. Now, this that is where we will start our project in those workshops. And the great thing about Grandmas is they are always open to new suggestions for the workshops. And we have actually have been approved by Grandmas to start our technology project. And also for this project, we have partnership with local universities. So how this how the lessons work is, for example, we have two students from our school in one classroom with about 20 kids. And there's also one student from university who sort of helps us organize the class. But three of us equally um, in the classroom stand as teachers. Um, and um, yeah, about, um, we will be working with about three schools and that will offer us about more than 450 children to work with. And that's a lot of kids. And here's a little video from Grandma's which can show you what kind of activities we do there. Cuando un niño conoce a alguien que lo motiva e inspira, se empieza a formar un sueño. El sueño de desarrollar una habilidad única. El sueño de ser grande. El sueño de vivir un futuro más allá del que imaginaba. Por eso en Crea Más, trabajamos para atender un puente en el sector educativo. 
en el que une a niños en riesgo social con jóvenes agentes de cambio. Para que un día ya no hablemos de sueños, sino de realidades. Mantengamos el sueño mío. Crea más. Creamos porque creemos. So that is Nero Corbe, and a few days ago we were actually honored with um, ASA Citizenship Award, which is a um, um, scholarship award for clubs, which um, is funded by South American International School Associations. Just about three days ago we were selected as a winner of other many community service clubs that applied. We actually won that award. $1,000 for the project, so I'm actually very proud. Wow. Right, so for our solution, we will be starting in April, and we'll be about um, we'll have about twenty children at first because it will be uh, somewhat of a trial run, and each session will consist of two hours each classes, and um, it will continue for twelve weeks. And here's little um, oh yeah, uh, for future plans. Furthermore, than um, those after those initiation process, we would like to work with um, companies such as Google because. Um, we're using Google as an education tool. Maybe I should explain this. Um, for my internship last December as part of my program, the Innovation Academy, I had to get in contact with some people, and I got in contact with one of the people at Google Lima. His name is Gary. And he told me that while he couldn't provide me an internship opportunity because of liability issues in case I die or whatever, um, <laughs> they had to pay some money or something. It's, just, it's, a, weird, it's a weird thing. Um, they told me, no, I really can't help you with that just now. I've been pushing the program, but you know what? If you have a service opportunity that can really take something off the ground, we can get Google to sponsor it. And you guys know, Google right now is like one of the number one corporations in, in the world in terms of funding, and if we get bagging from such a huge corporation, not only do we have access to pretty much any resource we need, but we have like the attraction that the name itself brings it. So who doesn't want to work under the name of Google, right? So no shortage of teachers, no shortage of funds, et cetera. Um, so we would like to um, spread this project one by one in different communities that's in poverty. And we would like to create self-sustaining communities, such as by sponsorship of Google. And through that, um, they'll be able to, um, Google will be able to fund the project. For example, these schools may not have internet, and they will need to pay monthly for this money. And we won't be able to provide it. But if companies such as Google will be able to fund it, then we'll be able to, well, those kids will have access to internet all, at all times, as long as they're at school. Um, so here's a little mini lesson which we will offer in the first class. Well, it's just an outline of it for Google search. So what this mini lesson was is really like an image of what we would be teaching in our class. So everyone here probably has used Google search. I'd be surprised if you haven't. And um, these are like some basics of, of how to use Google search that these students might not necessarily know about. So generally how to phrase what you're trying to look for using keywords, uh, connectors of Boolean logic such as and and or, uh, saving images, opening up the news. Uh, these are just a bunch of things that you need to know how in order to be able to get information from using Google search and in order to use it as an effective tool in your learning and everyday life. So this was just an, 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 like an image of what we would be doing. And, and I know it's a stretch, I'm just going to jump in really quickly here. All of you grew up with Google. All of you probably grew up with like an iPad in your hand, you know, and it was like one of the first things you probably learned how to use. But if you could take a second to imagine, you've never had the opportunity to do a Google search before. And just how empowering it would be to have someone teach you the basic skills for that without taking it for granted that you've never done it. Now, um, since you guys are probably great at technologies, we're going to offer a little activity, uh, which is digital scavenger hunt. And if you can take out like a digital device, phone, like or tablets, computers, anything that can connect into this. And then the next to that top of the front. The yeah, like in case you don't have like any really doubt any of you have phones. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Right, and if you can go to Wikipedia.org, and and also um, if you don't have internet, there are, there are like also tech people around us that can yeah, help you with that's it. That's tech people. <laughs> um, so if you can go to Wikipedia and search for article for digital divide. 
Yeah, the prize is chocolate. I do want to say there's the Sunday kids. Where is it? Oh, it's for kids for everybody. For everybody. For everybody. For everybody. Yeah. And this is a scavenger hunt. So this is a speed based game. So maybe I want you to get to the same point where they're at Wikipedia. Just make sure everyone gets there. And then it's really going to be speed based. So get to Wikipedia. Wikipedia.org. When we get there, what do we do? Wait there. Can we, uh, Anybody that's under, say, 40 has to tie one hand behind their back, their dominant hand. Um, well, you can like that. Oh, no. <laughs> Some of us are slow. I think we can see it. Wait, where are we? Are these on the bus? It's just fine. We can get it. We can get it. Come on, I'm in. Come on, I'm in. Come on, I'm in. Come on. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's the other part. Yeah, that's the starting point. That's the starting point. That's just the beginning. That's the beginning. With the <laughs> right, um, now the challenge here is to reach a page for Santo Domingo, the city we are currently in. But you can't oh, wait. search for it. Yeah, yeah that was. You uh, what, what? Only using hyperlinks. You know on Wikipedia, there are like little blue words that highlight it, which you can click on, and that's going to jump you to another page. That's probably related to your article. And from there, you can actually like um, jump between pages and reach um, another article. In this case, the destination is Santo Domingo. I think you got them at the so, hyperlink. They're already all going. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's a tricky way of thinking, right? You're not going to search for it. You've got to use the hyperlinks. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's say the first, the first is a piece of chocolate, and we're we're looking for Santo Domingo. And you need to be able to explain how you got there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. How did you get that? Well, I went from Santo Domingo within the Republic, which came from the Caribbean Spaniola, and then Christopher. Hey! Christopher Columbus. Hey! 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 Hey!
where you can make, I mean, your mind is now a series of type comments. Great. Yes. Um, Jeez. Jeez. So, maybe you might have not seen the purpose of this, but what we really were trying to highlight was the difference in connectivity and in just the access to information that people may have. You went from digital divide all the way to uh, Dominican Republic, to Santo Domingo, to chocolate, to Panda in a matter of minutes. I was telling you, like, the average was like 30 seconds. Imagine trying to do this using an encyclopedia. You'd have to search along the items. You wouldn't have the access to all the related subjects which you have in Wikipedia. And this is just one website. There's thousands of other resources which you can also use in order to enhance your learning. And this is the grain, the grain that we're trying to cover in our presentation. Yeah, yeah. Like to show the varieties of knowledge which can potentially be acquired just by your motivation to search for one word, like you didn't know what chocolate was, but you might end up like learning about pandas or anything similar to that. Anything about like just your motivation can like lead you anywhere in knowledge, and that's what internet offers. So to conclude, we want to solve the digital divide. Sorry, the digital divide can be solved through a widespread front, because there is pretty much two sections, that's why it's a divide. The ones that are, have access to technology and the ones that don't. By using the correct suite of technology, Google, and the right motivators apparently, chocolate, <laughs> we can create self-sustaining programs for kids that allow them uh, to learn and to continue learning. Essentially, we've created a 21st century education for a 21st century. <laughs> 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 Any questions? questions? I have a question. Okay. Um, as a teacher, like back home in the States, for example, when I thought about the digital digital divide, I wanted my students to have access at home because I knew I could provide it at school. And so my challenge was, okay, how do I give them access once they leave the school? And this maybe isn't your problem or your, your team's goal, but how do you maybe look for a solution in terms of the devices for them? Once in the school program. Yeah, so, um, actually, part of the TSA program is that they open the computer lab um, to whatever the students can use it. So, it wasn't a really geared towards giving them stuff to take home robbery, mistreatment, all these things. And for us, the, the idea is not the hardware center. But I can see where it came from. And the access to device is probably best to center it somewhere where they can go. Like in the States, they have public libraries. Um, I know in Peru, you can go somewhere and pay two solis for half an hour of using the internet. Not even two solis, it's like 10 seconds. It's dirt cheap. Yeah, internet use and internet cafe is actually pretty important. Yeah. Street, yeah. So uh, I would say that the best way to solve the hardware aspect of the digital divide is by providing a hub for accessibility. Your, your name is Joey, right? Yeah. Joey, it's a really good idea. The, the Technology Student Association does a great job of where we recycle our, what would actually become electronic waste if we didn't recycle it to other, other schools. What do you think, Matthias? Can we set up a program for students when they, because I feel like you guys go through these homes pretty quickly. So, so um, for students to donate phones to then be like, have tech at home on a smaller yeah. scale. The hardest thing about what we tried to do was um, the access to internet, because that requires an infrastructure which uh, houses might not even have. Some houses don't even have electricity or running water. So that's not really something that we would be able to do in a short term. Maybe in the long term, once infrastructure uh, evolves to the point in which we can have internet in their houses, after which we would be able to provide devices for them to connect to the internet with. But if we provide a central hub and we talk to a school so that they would allow access to the hub at all times, so that the students would be able to use it on their free time and connect and learn about technology in general. Uh, by doing this, we were we, we plan to, this was, this was pretty much our plan, in order to provide a hub to which they could connect and through this, connects to everything to the world through technology, through the internet. Yeah. Right there. Uh, wait. So, how did you guys find the inspiration to the, like to decide to like, teach all the children? How did you decide to use the ones that are like, the um, Well, when we were brainstorming out what we could do to help, uh, help. <laughs> when we were brainstorming on how we could uh, try to help on solving the digital divide, we were thinking about making it as easily accessible to anyone in the world as possible, because that's what the digital divide is all about, and making it 
So it was really simple to use and friendly. So the first, the first thing uh, kind of outrules Microsoft Word and any other um, uh, package like LibreOffice or whatever, <laughs> uh, any other uh, paid resource such as Microsoft Office. Because um, if you don't even have a computer, if you don't even have the internet, if you have to struggle each day in order to even just live your life, uh, you don't really have the, the money or the resources to buy something like an Office product, an Office suite. So by making it free, we open up the access to a lot more people. And especially for us, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have to uh, donate this, we wouldn't have to pay as much, so it would be easier to focus the money we did have on doing things that would enhance them further, such as providing more computers or faster internet. And then, by, making, by using Google, we also had the ability for them to collaborate with, between each other, because it's a function provided by Google Docs, and we also wanted this to be part of our project. And hey, for the, as for the first part of the question, how we motivated ourselves, we're three geeks that um, can't imagine a world without our smartphones, and there is a world that exists that doesn't have smartphones and doesn't have access to internet. And personally, that makes me really, really sad. And it just it actually hurts to think about like how limited that is for, for those kids. I have a question. Um, all of this, uh, from what I understood, you're working with the kids, and you'll be working with the students. Have you thought of, or is there anything in your plans coming up as to working also with the teachers who are going to be teaching those students? Because maybe sometimes they also don't know as much as, but like I have the hardest time trying to find things that you found in a second right now. And um, what are your plans towards that? So also closing that gap with the teachers. Um, if well, you have any, if you don't have any, it's a good question of what you thought about. Well, like the idea was um, our students lead us teachers, but that's also a good point. And we, you know, we will actually consider starting classes for teachers as well, because then they can actually yeah, um, apply those in their classes at school, the education they offer. But what we really wanted to do was uh, make the students teach their teachers on how to use technology. And yeah, that way it becomes self-sufficient and we don't have to um, apply as much effort and which classes in order to have the same goal. So we would implement that as of the idea of teaching your teachers on how we use technology into our classes if, when, when we do it and when we start making them. And if there's something, when they talk about self-sustaining, when you talk about teaching a classroom full of kids, like where they go for crema, so if they teach 30 kids in that room how to do this, I don't know about you as a teacher, but these guys teach me stuff all the time. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's really sort of, you know, going down to that level and then it going outwards and up from there. Um, so you guys are going to, what levels of students are going to be working so our, our, our main idea, our pilot project, is going to be focused on fifth graders, okay. uh, so on the ages of 12 yeah. and above. And after that, we're going to see how much success we have on that age group. And we're going to see if we can extrapolate this and start teaching classes on lower levels, such as um, perhaps less than 10 years old. And also, okay. we um, like to... So I'm wondering if you have any plans and with that also to teach about the safety, because that's going to become a very important component of using being connected to the World Wide Web and some of the dangers and problems, ethical and and responsible use of technology as well as, as just learning the basics of using technology. And a comprehensive digital citizenship plan. Well, we hadn't thought of that. Yeah, we so actually had, we had that's, uh, that's a really good idea concept to implement our classes. And also, the type of information that you encounter in Google may not be appropriate for that age level. So you might need to look at other resources that are more kid-friendly. I can give you some ideas on that. Yeah. Also, yeah. also yeah. Google so offers. To teach that at that level, so. We, we have a very rich, we have a, a grade 8 to 12, one one laptop program in our school. And so yeah. in, in grade 7 and 8, we have a, a series of sort of conference workshops to take kids for things like internet safety, how to cognitively establish a digital footprint. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a very rich set of resources within our school that would be yeah. easy to work into the set of lessons we'll get back. May I just say Google may not be an appropriate choice for searching at that age level because the information that you get since it's worldwide and it's just spidered in, it's it's very you know, it could be college level, it could be any level. So a fifth grader may not necessarily be able to use that information, so getting some other resources to help them read and know and they're yeah. Well great thing about Google is that yeah. um safe search, which they're not talking about safety, I'm talking about just 
the level of reading required. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, well, we have to wrap this up. So I'm just going to leave up here my contact, our contact information, in case you, like, for example, if you could send up some of those resources. I, would love to, yeah. I can show you my brain. I'd love for you guys to pick our brains some more as well, but we don't have time. So if you guys have any questions, send us an email or tweet at me. I'm always on Twitter. So. Thank you.